Okay, good afternoon. Welcome to our talk um, by Jeremias Rosler, who will be asserting that assertions are considered harmful, especially in um, testing, where there's a dilemma at the moment in testing. A lot of people are considering our regression tests aren't really working. People are cancelling them, costing a lot of time. And this dilemma is going to be resolved, at least, <laughs> um, by Jeremias. Okay, have an enjoy. Bye. Thank you very much. So, um, <laughs> um, so uh, when we talk about an assertion, just to get you all on the same page, what is an assertion? Um, we have assertions uh, from test automation, mostly from unit testing, where we test code. And here, for instance, uh, you see a very small test where we test uh, um, Java math uh, function at exact. And we assert that if we add one plus one, then the result should be two. And of course this works. And uh, what you can see in that small test is that um, a test usually consists of several parts. So we, uh, we have um, some code that creates a state. That wasn't the case here because the, the method that we wanted to test was a static method, so we didn't need to create objects or uh, prepare anything. But uh, in most unit tests, this is the case. Then we execute the code that we actually want to test. So we execute the feature. And then afterwards, we usually have some code to assert the result. So we, we verify that what we expect we, uh, should be returned is actually returned. Or verify that uh, the state that we expect, um, the, the, the changes to the state that should have happened, actually did happen. And the, the thing is that it's very... Um, so if you do it right, um, the unit test should only be changed if that feature ever changes, right? So you should mock away, for instance, the database, you should mock away most of the, the application logic as, as, I mean, <laughs> depending on the system, if it's possible, but uh, that's the, uh, the ideal case. Um, and then you test only and execute only the code that you want to test, and that test only needs to change once you change the feature. The problem is on the, U, on the UI level, a code or a test usually looks like that. So you have, um, so in that case, uh, let's go back. Uh, in that case, you, you want to test, uh, you still want to test um, the one plus one, but now you have a um, calculator on the website, for instance. And for some reason, because this is a very secret calculator, it's behind a lock, uh, lock uh, interface, so you need to log into the application to be able to you know, use the calculator. And um, as you can see, you have some code there that you need to execute in order to be able to test the feature that you actually want to test. And also, you have um, dependencies that don't, that are more or less random uh, depending on the UI. So you, you depend on the name, on the HTML name in that case, um, or uh, the layout or stuff like if, if you had XY coordinates, um, you would depend on the actual layout. And this also has nothing to do with the, with the functionality that you actually want to test. It's just more or less, um, uh, need uh, something that you need in order to to be able to execute the code, meaning that on the um, GUI you have your test usually looks like that. So you want to test the feature in the middle, but you need to log in. So if the login doesn't work, you can't test your feature. You need to execute the menu. If the menu doesn't work, you can't test your feature. And um, in mostly, um, like you need to log out or shut down or whatever. So your code, the code that you want to test, um, is in between the rest of the application. And you need to execute that code as well, and you depend on it. And if that code changes, like if the login changes, um, you need to adapt your test, although your test has nothing to do with the login. You, t you still only want to execute uh, the calculator functionality, but you have to adapt the code if the login changes or the menu changes or any of that. Which, of course, is the reason for the famous test pyramid, which says that on the unit level, you should test as much as you can, 
and uh, less in between because here the, the problems that I just mentioned start. And on the UI level, you want to test as few as possible and as late as possible. Like um, only when once the uh, software is stabilized, if it doesn't change anymore, right? Because uh, of the reasons that the cost of fragility and the maintenance go up as you go up the, the stack, so to say. And this uh, example with a, with a calculator is only a toy example. In the real world, you have, for example, something like that. So you, you have a whatever ugly table that you know, shows some random data that you want to test. And if you want to create um, assertions for that, the assertions look like that. So that's hard to read, hard to understand. <laughs> you don't even know what it means eventually. Like if, if, if this is code that someone else wrote, uh, a test that someone else created, and you have to maintain it after one year or something, you don't even know what it references really, and probably I don't understand how that values came to be. You just need to, to update them. Okay, so this is less than ideal. How can we change that? Well, let's talk about again what an assertion actually does. Well, that's easy, right? An assertion does assert correct behavior. Well, what is correct behavior? For instance, if I have a very simple mathematical uh, equation and I say one minus two, so what's the correct answer to that? Who thinks the correct answer is minus one? Okay, so if you have a calculator, that's true. But maybe you don't have a calculator, maybe you have some sort of um, system um, where you have um, um, a, a card and the, the minus two is uh, a gift certificate. So you don't want to pay back money to the customer, right? In, in case the, 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 um, the, the gift that he has is, is higher uh, in value than the uh, amount he wants to, um, to pay with, uh, he wants to pay, then this should result to zero, right? Then this is the correct answer. Or maybe you're talking about an alarm clock. Then the correct value should be 23 or 59, depending on whether you're working with hours or minutes. Or um, it's a calendar. Then it should be between, you know, any of those value. Um, or... Um, it's uh, you're in physics and this is degree Fahrenheit, then there is no such thing as minus anything like because it, you know, zero is the absolute bottom, then you throw an exception or, or, or. So there are many more number of possible use cases that this could possibly resolve to. Meaning that even for such a simple question, there is no definite correct answer that will never change. And this is a problem, right? Because a test, what a test does is it takes you the truth and fixes it potentially forever. So that, that's the ideal. Like you never have to touch the test again. And this works well if you have a, a development model like that. Then you have your requirements and they are meant to not change ever again. Then you can write your tests here and well, you're good. Too bad that today <laughs> most of us have a situation like that and you need to change your software all the time and there is no truth. So there is no correct behavior. Correct lies in the eye of the, uh, eye of the beholder. Okay, um, I have a few examples uh, to, to uh, maybe make you laugh a bit. Um, the question is, when is a bug a bug? So what, what is correct behavior, right? Because as I just mentioned, the notion changes. Um, well, a bug is a bug when it's not a feature. So as you can see, here's a beetle with a feature plate on it. Uh, a few examples. Um, in early days, um, in Unix, everything was on the, on the uh, one, uh, on the top level um, uh, hierarchy. Actually, there were no file hierarchies, and there were so many files that people had problems of tracking them. So they said, okay, we need to implement a hierarchical file system. And then they uh, implemented the dot and the dot dot operator to reference um, the current directory or the parent directory. And there's this, um, this command ls, list files, and what it does is it just lists all the files, and the problem is that it listed those two as if they were physical files, like 
actual physical files on the file system. And um, so what they did is they, they adapted the ls command saying that if the first character is a dot, just in the loop, continue, ignore the file. Well, you can, of course, rename a file such that the first character is a dot, making the file disappear. So this was a bug. But as you all know, <laughs> nobody ever fixed it because we now have hidden files. The, the, um, the administrators love that feature. So um, we have hidden files. They start with a dot. And all they did is extend the ls command with minus a, show all files, even the hidden ones, um, to make the files reappear. So this bug turned into a feature. And uh, another example, um, you probably know that game, a space arcade, um, where you ha have a spaceship and, and um, shoot at the aliens. And the thing is, the more aliens you killed, the faster the game got. But this was not an intention. The problem is that um, at the time, hardware was very... Um, not as high uh, in performance as it is today, meaning that the less elements uh, were needed to be rendered on the screen, the, the faster they could be rendered, um, making the game faster. So this game becoming faster was not a feature, but it became one. And uh, last example, uh, you probably know Google Mail, and uh, there's this feature that you can undo sending an email. Well, this was an accident. <laughs> The thing is that Google has um, services all throughout, and when you click on send, um, it just takes a couple of seconds to actually send, because you know you have to validate the email, you have to make sure that it's not sending a virus and whatever, so it, they had a delay, they had a lag. It, take, it took a couple of seconds to actually send the email, and when they wanted to um, release the the, uh, the product, they, they couldn't get rid of that lag. So what they did is in t instead, they turned it into a feature and said, okay, now you have time, th the time it takes us to validate whatever, uh, the email address and, and that there's no virus in it, uh, that's the time you have to click on undo. So they turned this problem into a feature. And what, uh, what I want to say with this is there is no such thing as correct behavior. So an assertion can't assert correct behavior. What it instead does is it detects a change. Okay, I want to explain that briefly. Um, how do you do manual testing? Like when you manually test code, you execute it and then you compare um, what you expect with what you see. So this can be the model in your head, this can be the documentation, this can be some form of written specification, it doesn't matter. So have, even if you just imagine what the outcome should be, you have um, an expected result and you have an actual result. And either those match, like what you see is uh, what you expected, then you're fine, right? The test passed. Or, um, you don't get what you see, uh, you don't um, uh, get, get what you expect. So what you see is different from what you expected. Then you found a bug, right? Well, maybe, because it could be that um, you were wrong with what you expected in the first place. Maybe you had the wrong model in your head. Maybe um, the user specification was outdated or the documentation was outdated. Maybe whatever. So what you see could be the correct behavior and you realize once you analyze that you were wrong about your expectation, right? So, and th the same happens with, te with test automation. Th this is manual testing, but it applies as well to test execution. If you execute a test and the test fails and you have a look at it, then you can see maybe you updated your software and the test now fails because it's outdated and need to be, needs to be updated, right? And with that, with that, I want to say that automated regression testing is not testing because testing is... Um, very challenging, you have, to, you have to question what you see. And with regression testing, we merely do version control. So the problem is, and I'll come to back to that uh, in a second. Um, and if you look at that, where the effort comes in, if you want to automate that process, you have effort here, where you create the expected values or all those asserts that you just saw, 
like the, the, the bunch of asserts, you need to write that down. This is effort. And once it changes, you have effort to update it. You have to rewrite them like this, right? You, you need to write that down. You need to find out uh, what the correct X path is. Then you need to write down the, the value that you expect for each and every one of them. And once the values change, because whatever, the calculation changes, the underlying data changes, whatever, you have to update that. And all it gives you is to detect changes. Now I want to think. Uh, I want you to think about manual version control. So if you had, if you don't, didn't have Git or SVN or whatever your uh, uh, favorite um, version control system is, what you would do is uh, you have your sources, and um, you want to make sure that if you change those sources unintentionally, um, you can you can um, uh, undo the change. Like you can you can. Um, backup. So what you do is you just make a copy of that and call it backup. And once in a while you make a diff. You have some program that compares the two and shows you what the diff is. And if you say, okay, this is, um, I wanted that change. That change is okay. I want that. And then you do a, a manual copy of the source file into the backup folder. Okay. Nobody would ever do that. Like that's we, we, we're glad we're using Git that does this for us. But this is what we do essentially with test automation. So with test automation, um, we create a manual backup, and then once in a while we, we create the diff, and then if we have a difference and we say, ah, I, I need to update the, the, the reference, then we, we do a manual copy of the difference into the backup folder. So this is what we do with regression testing. Like if we have that. And on top of that, that isn't even complete. So it detects changes, but only some of the changes. This only detects if that number changes, or that number changes, or that number changes. Like if I have a website that looks like that, and I only check that the, that the strings are on the website, the test is green. It says, yeah, all the strings are there. I can't, as a user, I can't use that website anymore, but the test is green. So, okay, we want to use version control. So what's, what's the problem here? Why, why can't we use version control? We use it for, um, for source files and for static artifacts. Um, but the problem is a source file is not the software. And the configuration is not the software. Software, th this is merely um, the starting point, because then I have the runtime um, environment, I have the underlying data, I have third party services, whatever. So this is not that, right? So I, I have version control here, but actually what I want is version control here. It's comparable actually to um, architecture. The source code is like a, the building plan the plan of the building, right? So this defines how, roughly the size and, and roughly how it looks like, but it's totally different from the actual building, okay? Here I have like colors of the, of the walls and I have plants and I have furniture and I have much more. And all of this is missing in the plan. And uh, usually, oh, sorry, <laughs> this is German. Um, so the, the gap is closed with automated tests. What an automated test does is it turns that dynamic software into a static artifact. So it, it uh, encodifies what, what the dynamic software looks like and makes it static so that I can put it in version control. I can version control tests. Tests are a code. So I can version control the test whereas I want to version control the dynamic software. So I, this is what I want to version control. And in order to be able to verify that the code actually loads that data, if I execute it, I create a test. And this is giving me version control for that. And as I said, it's incomplete. And uh, it just checks what, it's, what I tell it to check. And the problem is um, that is essentially blacklisting changes. So what this means is that whenever that value changes, I get notified. So this test tells me whenever this value changes, it fails. So I notice. And then I can, um, as I said earlier, I can have a look at the test and say, okay, either now the test is outdated and I need to update the test or my software changed unintentionally and I can 
uh, roll back the change or fix it. But it's blacklisting of changes. I have to tell it individually, check this, check this, check this. And if I forget something, if I forget to check something, I never get notified. Um, if I want, if I was uh, to do, um, if I was to configure a firewall, for instance, uh, blacklisting in the firewall is a very bad idea because uh, you say, okay, don't connect to port 510, don't connect to port 1211, whatever. Okay, you wouldn't do that with with a uh, with a firewall. With a firewall, you want a whitelist approach. You want to say, okay, no connections allowed except for HTTP, HTTPS, whatever. Um, so you open individual ports. But with testing, we do it the other way around. And people have noticed. So for instance, Google um, has this um, this approach, uh, whitelisting, uh, whitelist testing approach, um, because they have the problem um, when they implement a new feature like that that combo box, um, they they mark it on the user interface for the testers. So they have a specific uh, marker, and it shows up as a dancing pony. So when you are a tester at Google, um, you test your software and you look for the dancing ponies and you know, okay, this is new functionality, I need to test this, or this is changed functionality, I need to test this. But the problem is, at some point, they forgot to uh, remove the markers. So the actual customers in production uh, had those dancing ponies on their screen. And for some reason, nobody came up with the idea to create a test uh, to have a look whether there's a dancing pony on the screen. I don't know. So the, 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 the thing is that you, you cannot check what you don't expect. Like, you wouldn't write a test for a dancing pony if you didn't think that it could potentially happen that a dancing pony could be on the screen. So you don't write a test for that. So this is a problem with, white, uh, with black box testing, right? With black box testing, you don't write an assertion for something that you don't ever potentially uh, think could happen. So, Blacklisting changes is a bad idea. This is the reason why I say assertions are to be considered harmful on the UI level or on any interface level. Um, and on top of that, usually, um, so with blacklisting of changes, what I do is I say test, uh, check that, check that, check that, and I get a kind of I get I get uh, into there. So I have some amounts of checks that I want to perform. And on the other side, if I do whitelisting of changes, I say ignore that, ignore that, ignore that, and I get into the middle where I don't check everything. Like with Git, you have an ignore Git ignore file, you don't, uh, you don't version control log files, you don't version control class files, and a whole bunch of other stuff, um, which, is, which means that you ignore some of the changes. Um, but I guess that the ideal amount is not in the middle, but somewhere there. Usually you want to check more then you don't want to check. Depends on your specific project, of course. So, as I said, this is essentially this, only in bad. <laughs> um, now, what can we do about that? Um, what potential solutions are there? Well, um, of course you can do a pixel diff. So that's the easiest solution. It's easy to implement. Um, it's easy to roll out. It works for almost any uh, user interface uh, technology. And because of that, there are a whole bunch of tools. Okay, so if you want to do pixel diff, you can use any of those, and I, th I mean, I'm sure there are more. Um, but of course, pixel diff is fragile. Like if you, if you uh, create the pixel um, golden master on your local machine and load it up to the server, the server probably has a different operating system and you have differences. Um, there are other alternatives. Um, text test, for instance, is working in Python, and uh, it's turning everything into a text file. So you, you have a sc screen scraper um, that scrapes your screen and, and turns it into text, and you can have a comparison with that. Or approval test. I, I recommend this if you, for instance, work with uh, XML or anything. Um, so you can just uh, call approvals.verify and, and put something in there, a file, a string, whatever, and it will do that. It will give you golden master testing. And just recently, Facebook, um, you probably heard about that, uh, gave, um, published a test. Um, Snapshot-based testing is what they call that. It's essentially the same um, on, on gadget level. So for individual gadget, it's, it's between unit and, and um, 
uh, GUI testing. So if you have React components, you can test individual, individual React components with that. And what we do currently is, um, because all of those have some limitations, um, we came up with our own solution <laughs> that I would briefly want to go, since we're on the Frostcon, uh, we briefly want to go into that. And uh, the idea is that you call just check on, for instance, on the driver, and, and what this does is gives you golden master testing. So now I want to switch uh, to a live demo. <laughs> Hope this works. Okay. So, can you see that? Can you read it? So this is essentially um, a test, a um, usual um, Selenium test. What we do here is we start the server and we create a new Chrome driver and then we log into the system, then we click on, on a bunch of, of um, elements. This is essentially um, a very... So this is code. Um, that it's meant to be like legacy. So this is a very um, small legacy application, so to say. So this code is very ugly and very, very, very not uh, understandable. And it's meant to be that way uh, in order to, to exemplify what I want to show. And here you do the assert. So you, here you see that um, all of those uh, things that you clicked on actually appeared on, uh, appeared on the screen. So I want to want to show that. Hope this works. Oh, it ah, okay. Sorry, uh, again. Oh, why isn't it showing? So here you can see. Um, very. Okay, I'll put a breakpoint here. So as you can see, yeah, as you can see um, here, I have a number of products, and as I click on on order, I have a card, and the show the, the individual product show up in the card, and this is essentially what I what I want to test. So if I run this code, um, it just verifies that all of the products have been uh, added to the card. This is what I do here. So and it works. So and as you can see, um, it's, it's as before, it's very clunky and ugly and, and very hard to maintain. So what I want to do instead, oh, I want to use our library. So now I say start test. Um, and now I can replace all of those assertions. The, they actually go away, and I just say recheck driver, and optionally I uh, put a, a name. And so I can, I can have multiple checks throughout the test, so I can have uh, many of those, and those won't fail, they, they will just... Um, uh, summarize all of the differences and in order to make the test fail I have to say cap test and that actually f is the, the place where the test fails. So if there are differences then here the test fails. Now I can execute that. I hope it works. So again I'll log in. I you know uh, do all, the, all of that stuff and as you can see the test failed because I this is the first time I execute the test, so now I need to create the golden master. Now I need to, um, as you can see below, no you can't. So the test failed here and it says, okay, um, there's, I, I didn't have anything to compare against. So th this is the reason I fail. And now what it did is it created um, a new resource here that's named after my test. And with XML, and here you have all of the um, you have all of the properties that are checked. Like, um, and 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 it doesn't check the HTML; it checks the DOM. So after um, evaluating the CSS and the JavaScript, um, it checks the properties of the individual HTML tags and um, writes it down in that structure. And if I execute that again, 
now because now I have a golden master to test against. So now it's green. As you can see, test passes, nothing changed. Now I can change, for instance, uh, details of the product. So I just changed the, the price of a product and I rerun that. Yeah. And now the test fails and it fails. Can you see that? It says, okay, um, before the value was 15.15 uh, .15, and now the value is 126.25. So this is what I changed and uh, it, it detected that change. And I also can change, for instance, ah, okay, I can, I can show that. Um, now, if I say um, recap, now I get a file created that I can apply. So like um, with, uh, with, with Git, uh, with Git, you just can commit a change. You can, uh, the the Git um, interface shows, okay, here is a change. You wanna you wanna accept that change as permanent, and we implemented that as well. What you do is, um, so we um, we are going to implement a um, command line interface for that. But here we have the GUI. Oh, sorry. And as you can see, my test created that and it shows, okay, here is the change. So before it was 15.15 .15, and now it's uh, 126.25, whatever. And I can review that and I can say accept. So, okay, in the future, I want that change to be the truth. Th this should be the change that I want to test against. I say apply. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. Um. Okay, this worked in the, when I tried it. <laughs> um, usually what happens is that I can just apply that. What happened? Okay. And if I rerun that, uh, then it's green again. Uh, obviously it doesn't uh, work now because I did something to the demo, whatever. Okay, and it also works um, if I change um, uh, CSS elements. For instance, if I change the color and I rerun that. Then the test also fails. And this time it says, okay, what did I do? Okay, I'm sorry. Now, okay, and um, this time it fails and says, okay, there's a change. I'm sorry, I can't, can't make that any bigger um, with the IDE. Um, it says the, the color changed. So it detected that color change. And as you can see, that color change happened in one place. So here um, I, I, I changed the color to um, H1 elements, for instance, and it shows me all the elements where that change actually happened. So there are a bunch of H1 elements and it, uh, it shows me all of those. And now I can use um, the client again. And for instance, if I open the result, here, as you see, now it says um, the color changed. And now I can, I can say I want to ignore that. So uh, maybe this is something that changes frequently. Maybe this is something I'm not interested in, whatever. So if you have a pixel-based tool, you can't do this. Like with a pixel tool, you can't say, for instance, ignore the font size or ignore the font, font type, whatever, because um, it, a pixel comparison doesn't give you that information. But here you have a semantic comparison and you can just say ignore whatever it is that, that I'm not interested in. And then um, if I apply that and I re-execute the test, now as you see, 
it's green again because it just it now knows that I'm not interested in the in the color information. So it doesn't check the color information anymore. Okay. Um, so that's for the demo. And um, it has so th this is um, the the many things that are uh, positive about this is that's m very easy to create assertions because you don't have code uh, individual assertions. You just say check and it checks everything. Um, and also it's very easy to update those assertions or those checks, those code masters. And um, it's complete. So it checks everything. If anything changes, um, then you're free to say, I want to ignore that change in the future because I'm not interested in, um, or it actually showed you a change that you would have otherwise potentially missed. And what it also gives you, because it checks everything, um, if something changes, so one problem with a test like that is, uh, sorry, I'm going back to the test. One problem with a test like that here um, is also that you need to find elements. Right? You need to find element to, to um, send keys or that, that you want to click on. You need to identify a component. And with that, uh, for instance, you do it here by ID. You give it the ID username. And if that ID ever changes, your test breaks. Because you can't find that component anymore, the test doesn't know where to click on or where to send keys to, and the test fails. But now, um, you have more information, you have redundant information. You, you know not only um, which name it has or which ID, you also know the path and the label and the pixel coordinates and what else. And you know um, those information not only about the button that you maybe want to push, but about each and every element on the UI. So you can do a one-on-one -on -one comparison. If you have many changes here, for instance, if the city gets moved, uh, the street gets renamed, um, those two get switched, whatever, and you want to click the accept button, and the accept button now is called save. With a regular test, if you identify it by, by the label, you won't be able to find it, because it now has a different label. But because And the problem is that you only have that one piece of information. You have that one piece label accept and if that piece is missing you're not going uh, you're not able to identify that but now what we have instead we don't have only one piece we have the whole puzzle so we have all the elements at once and we know that this button is that button and that there's no other button there so we know that this button is probably that button just by uh, uh, conclusion so we, we now have the whole piece, uh, the, the whole puzzle, and not only a single piece. And that means it's much easier to identify that element. And the tests doing that, your tests get much, much more robust. So we can say, OK, with a test like that, for instance, um, it used to be ID username. Now that ID changed. But I can look up in the golden master. I can say in the golden master, that ID is username. In the golden master, it's still there. I can say, oh, um, instead of just failing, I can tell the user, look, your ID changed. It used to be username. Now it's whatever. Please update the test. I can tell the user what the problem is. Or I can even have um, a generated ID, for instance, something like that. And if the, th that is not showing that, that is stable, that is not showing in the UI. And if I reference that ID in my test, my test is never going to fail. Because whatever changes, I, can, I have this um, induced stable ID that I can reference. We call it retest ID because whatever. <laughs> it's the ID that, that is generated by retest. And if you reference that, we can identify the element, whatever the changes. If the label changes, if the ID changes, if the XPath changes, as long as there are, you know, if, if it's the same page and there are some elements that we can make a one-on-one -on -one assignment, we're going to be able to identify your element and, and make the test pace, uh, pass. So, um, right. Um, so, that's already it. I was faster with my demonstration than I anticipated. <laughs> um, are there any questions? Thank you. Yes? Uh, isn't there some danger by uh, 
Sorry. Isn't there some danger by using multiple information to identify this label that maybe it gets uh, attached to the wrong uh, element? Um, no, because as I said, we have um, we have this redundant information not only of the button that we want to press, but of every element. So of every element, we know the X path, the name, the ID, the whatever. So we can we can just make a one-on-one -on -one assignment. So we can say, okay, this element, uh, it's not last name, it's for name. Uh, yeah, it's last name. Ah, there's, no, it didn't switch actually. Ah, okay, <laughs> that's wrong in the in the graphics. Sorry, um, but I can say, okay, this um, is is called last name, and maybe the X path changed, maybe the ID changed, um, but the label did not. So I can still say, okay, this is likely to be to be that. Ah, now the contents changed. Ah, I see. Okay, and this is likely to be that, right? So, so I have still have um, um, some information left um, to to make that assignment. So. As I said, I don't have a single puzzle, a uh, single piece of puzzle. I have the whole puzzle, and I can take the, all the old pieces of the puzzle and all the new pieces of the puzzle and say, okay, th they match closest. And then I can say, uh, this is probably that element. And, and in case I'm wrong, I mean, you, don't, you shouldn't do that in production, of course, because if this is a delete database button, you probably don't want to try out. But if, uh, if you're on the test system, uh, it's fair enough to just say, okay, this is probably that button, I, I just keep on running and ask the user afterwards, and in 99% of the time, this is what the user wants. So you, instead of a failing test, you just have a change, and the user gets shown what changed, and that uh, he can just confirm if that's what, what, uh, what happened. Okay. Any more questions? Um, if I understand you correctly, the whole gold master is kept in one file, and yes. this file is committed to a source control system. Yep. How do you handle things which um, occur in all of these files? For example, the mm -hmm. save button, and you have 1,000 tests, all of them have a save button, um, and now you want to change it to accept or something. How that's, do you handle that? Yeah, that's a very good question. Actually, I forgot to show that. Thanks for asking. <laughs> so now I have a test case with three uh, gold masters and now it should fail because two of them are missing. Right, and it did, very good. And I execute it again. And now it should be green because now I have all three gold masters. So, right, and now I change something. For instance, I change, uh, I change that. I hope that's actually captured. <laughs> Um, because this is this is still under development. Hmm? Sorry. Uh, nee, um, eben habe ich die. Um, uh, I just uh, switched the color to to ignore, and now I changed the line height, and um, the line height actually did result in a change. And now I can load that change, so like that. And as you see, the line height um, is here. And if I accept that, then the same changes get accepted here as well. So if it's the same change to the same element, we propagate that. Okay? So I say accept. And as you see, so this change here is the same as here. And if I, if I unaccept that, you see? So we, we just say, um, and we want to implement more of those uh, qualifiers. So you can say, accept all line height changes and accept all whatever uh, attribute changes. We, 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 this is what we're going to do with the command line interface. But for now, it's, if it's the same change to the same element, it, it gets accepted uh, throughout. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Okay. Um, uh, would I have a second? Yeah, okay. 
What you just demonstrated is inside one test case. So yep. uh, if I have uh, several test cases for the same page, uh, I still have to do it for, for every test case. Nope. Um, um, you can have several test cases and several suites um, as long as they're executed um, in one run. Um, oh, okay. This applies. Okay. So that, that were an additional question or? Ah, sorry. So if, if you know in advance that you're not interested in like color changes and stuff like that, can you ignore that from the beginning or do yes. you have like, Yes, yeah? um, so uh, right now we, you can ignore it from the UI, uh, from, from that UI, but we, we're going to implement something like the ignore file like it. So you can say ignore that attribute uh, wherever. Okay, yeah. And also, uh, like in the last minute of the presentation you said, um, as long as it's on the same page, so so how does it track or know which page the elements are on when, so, when you give this uh, retest ID or, or whatever? Yeah. So right, um, so th this is a bit tricky of course, um, but um, the way it's implemented is that as long as we think it's the same element and, with, and we give adapters so that you can implement your own um, um, tr threshold and your own um, ideas of, of what, what makes an element. So if you have, for instance, a, a fixed uh, ID that never changes, then you can say whenever it has the same ID, it's the same element, if you, if you want to have that strategy. And otherwise, we have a default strategy that falls into place, but if you have a better strategy for your specific um, situation, then you can uh, give, us, uh, give that to us. All right, thanks. Yeah. How do you deal with fields which are related somehow? For example, you deliver or you put something in your shopping basket, press uh, submit order, and then you get a date saying uh, your delivery will be on the 1st of September. 2018 or something. How do you deal with that? So right now, um, what you do is you ignore it. If it's if it's a date and it changes constantly, you ignore it. But um, at some point in the future, you will. So this is um, ongoing development. So this is um, uh, mostly open source, um, as you can see here. Um, retest on GitHub, uh, retest, recheck web. You can find uh, the current version. As you see, it's uh, 0.3 right now. So this is. This is just a prototype for now, um, but what we will give you is the possibility to define um, rules like, like you would in an assert where you, where you say this uh, should be a date uh, or this should be um, a date that's you know three days in the future or whatever. So you can, you can have your own check code if, if it's more complicated than just checking a, a certain value. I've got a question. Sure. You said, I just caught you saying it's mostly open source. Yes. That means um, the colors are free or can so, I make a contribution or is there a benevolent fascist over at the top telling me <laughs> you can't make contributions? So the thing is that the UI, so our idea is that we want to, uh, we, we say we want to create a kit for the GUI. So um, we create um, that API that you just saw, which is open source and the CLI. Um, um, Interface, so on the command line, you can use it for free, and, and it's op all open source, um, but the GUI uh, will be the part where, where we make money and make a living from. So if you want to use the GUI, you, you, and you don't have an open source project yourself, um, then you would need to buy a license. Is free means free beer, as last night, or is that LPG? So the, so the API and the command line interface is open source and free, mm -hmm. and the, the GUI is neither. <laughs> so. Okay. Um, is it possible to write the files that retest generates by yourself or are they not human readable? I'm thinking of the use case where you have two people and one person is going to implement a new feature, the other person wants to write the test beforehand, so there's nothing to compare yet, but they agreed on there will be a new button that will do this, please start writing the test while I code the feature. Is that somehow possible or can you only really work after the fact? 
So um, it is possible in principle. Um, we have no uh, tutorial for that. But what, what we create is an XML file right now um, that's human readable. So you see what is what is um, what, what we compare against, and you even can manually change that XML. And in principle, what you could do is you generate a, an empty XML file, and you can just um, mock uh, a, a screen. So you can you can have a, a scrape uh, mock mock screen whatever, and uh, the user ten, uh, the user decides if the new um, gold master is better than the old one, right? So if if the user decides that the um, interface that your that your application generates is actually the implementation of the mockup screen that you put uh, the image there, um, then you can accept that and and it gets overwritten. But that way you can come up with a test first implementation. But we don't have a tutorial yet for that. Any more questions? Okay, so if there are no more questions, thanks for listening. And if you um, think that might be helpful, uh, you could help us by um, go, uh, going on GitHub and uh, have a look, uh, having a look at that. Uh, maybe star us or um, you know, follow us on Twitter or whatever. And uh, yeah, that would be great. Thank you very much. <laughs> ah, and uh, I forgot to mention, this is what I just showed is an X is uh, implementation for web, but because um, the approach is very general, we also have implementations ready for uh, XML, if you, for instance, generate XML files, or for log files, if, if that's what you're in, or for Swing. So um, we, we are adding uh, implementations for other UI technologies, like uh, in a couple of months there will be added an implementation for mobile, for, for apps, uh, if you're, if you're uh, generating that, or if, you, if that's your user interface, and much more uh, in the future. Thank you.